Ambassador, uh, I am honored. Um, as you know, I'm German, and uh, you know Germans always have this complex vis-à-vis uh, -vis Sweden because Sweden seems to be doing everything right. You know, in many cases, it's sort of a role model uh, for not just Europe, uh, but I think also here in Japan, uh, people look at the Swedish model of doing things, whether it's in the economy, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the environment, um, you know, look at Sweden as, you know, the star of the Nordic model where things seem to be working very well. So I'm, I'm very glad that today I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting behind, you know, the Swedish flag, um, you know, here. But Ambassador, um, I don't want to steal your thunder. So without further ado, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper. And thanks to e-house for having me this morning and thanks for the breakfast guests here at the international house and also online from i don't know cyberspace or all <laughs> over the world it is wonderful to to see you here and thank you for your very flattering comments <laughs> i think right now sweden is doing it right uh, you might know that we had elections on sunday i will come back to that uh, and the election result is not finished yet so we are counting at the moment and one of the things I am tremendously proud about, uh, and I will say a few words later on that, we have eight Swedish parties in the Swedish parliament. All of them have now said, let's calm down. We need to continue the counting. Let democracy has its due course. We will respect the result when it comes tonight in Sweden. And it's extremely close. I just came back from Europe. Uh, I was there for five weeks. I had a fantastic holiday uh, because the year before I spent most of the time here in Tokyo mm. because it was Olympics. Uh, it was also a great thing. Yes, I'll, let me speak for maybe 15 minutes. I want to do three, four points. First, say a few words on what is this place, Sweden? Where are we? How do we fit, fit in? And then a few words on the situation right now what's happening in Sweden at the moment, and then a little global outlook, perhaps, looking ahead, both in Sweden, in Europe, and in the world, not least connected to Japan, what do I see? So starting to put Sweden a bit on the map, one of my favorite figures to think about is to think Nordic. If you take the five Nordic countries, Sweden, and our brothers Finland, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, if you do that, we are 27 million people together. Mm. Sweden is 10, so together we are 27 million people. If you take our economies, our GDPs, and add them up together, these five countries, we are economy number 11 in the world. And that's pretty fascinating, and the Japanese would enjoy that the country we are then pushing down to the 12th place is South Korea. No more comment on that. Uh, so that is, uh, that is where we are. We are far up north, and we have really a long history of being globalized. When I listen and speak to Swedish companies, uh, I very often hear that they say, every time we start a business, we think global immediately, because mm. Sweden is too small. And I think this has created our mindset since centuries back. I think it could even, it's a bit of a fun story perhaps, but you could think of the Vikings, what they were doing. Of course, we know that they were not always very gentle to people, but what they did is that they went out. They were curious super curious forefathers of us went to see the world and brought home the best they could find and adapted it to Sweden. And I think this is in our, this is in our mindset. We want to be exposed to the world, we want to bring things back, and we think we benefit from it. When I came back from Sweden the other week, I was struck that pandemic is totally over in Europe. It's totally finished in Sweden. If it really is medically, I cannot say, but in the mindset of people, it's gone. Mm. You see zero persons having a mask on, you see no one talking about it, there are no regulations. If you feel a bit sick, you stay home. If you feel okay, you go back to work. People kiss and hug. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's an interesting observation, if you are in Japan, that this is happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, if we look if I look back, I'm, I'm 54, if I look back what has happened during my lifetime in my country, I see four enormous changes that perhaps people don't really think about. First of all, we joined the EU in 1995. 
Sweden is often described as a neutral country. We are not a neutral country. It was a long time ago we were a neutral country, but when we joined the EU, we started to say that we were militarily alliance-free. Because joining the EU in 1995, of course, is joining an alliance of like-minded when it comes to values and norms and so on. So that's one huge change that has happened in my country. Second one is that Sweden has liberalized its economy and its society quite enormously, actually. And uh, we are sometimes perhaps seen as a social democratic or perhaps even a socialist state at times. But please note that we have liberalized much of our welfare system. The tax system has been enormously liberalized in the 2000s, where inheritance tax is gone, gift tax is gone, uh, capital tax is to a minimum. So it's, it's basically, we, we tax income. And you can argue if that's a good or a bad idea, but that's what we do. Another thing that has tr meant a lot for our society is migration. Migration first, a long time ago, 100 years ago, I was so honored to meet a, a fellow Swede uh, back in a few generations. <laughs> a grand, grandfather, a great, great grandfather that moved to the US, as so many Swedes did in the end of the 1800s. At that time, we were 5 million people. Oh. About 1 million moved to the US. That's 20% of the population took off. There are reasons for that. We can discuss it. But regardless, that also shows a bit of what Swedes did. They moved. Now we see another flow. Mm. So Sweden has seen an enormous amount of immigrants, both work immigrants since, since the Second World War, but most recently, in the last 15, 20 years, asylum seekers that we have felt we need to receive. Many would argue, and this I will come back to in the political debate right now, that perhaps we took in too many, but regardless, the, whole, the thought from the beginning was we have a fantastic country, and if people are running away from war, and from oppression, we need to receive them. So of our 10 million people today, Swedish people are 10 million, 2 million are from other countries. But they are not foreigners, they are Swedes. So they are neutralized, they, have become, they are Swedish citizens, they are Swedish, but 20% of the Swedish people do not look like me. And that's, in, that's important to know. And the fourth point, joining NATO. Mm. And this is happening right now. Security situation. I need to say a few words on the security situation, of course. I, would, I never believed in my life that we would join NATO. I, uh, <laughs> because I, I really thought after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, or the, not the collapse, the collapse of the Soviet Union system, mm -hmm. and thereby the tearing down of the Berlin Wall and a new world order emerging, we all hoped, naively, you can say in hindsight, uh, that this would be the, the great days of uh, liberty and glory. Uh, Russia has been the Swedish neighbor forever. It's geography. We have been living with this superpower uh, and this great country next to us all the time, and we have interacted with it. Right before Christmas last year, Russia sent letters to Sweden and to other countries in Europe saying, do not change the security order of Europe. Stop expanding NATO. And, we want, and there were specific comments on what countries were supposed or not supposed to do. We reacted very strongly and felt no other country tells us how we should behave when it comes to our own security. Finland reacted the same way. So if you make this a very short summary, you could say if Putin's ambition with his war in Ukraine was to stop the expansion of NATO, he at least has managed with one thing, that is to have Finland and Sweden applying for NATO membership. And now we are very close to be accepted. Uh, this was a huge thing because, as I said a little while ago, the self-image of Swedes is that we are neutral, or those who read and think a little bit realize that we are at least military non-aligned. But now, in a matter of months, we went from having that position to saying we need to join NATO because <coughs> we see no other alternative. And now we had elections on Sunday. We have elections every four years. We have a proportional system in the parliament. So it's really the proportional list system of parties that get more than 4%. That is a threshold to get into the Swedish parliament. Uh, they were going to compete uh, for elections this year. We have an enormous turnout, turnout. I say enormous, and I mean it, because compared to many other democracies, a turnout of 87, close to wow. 88%, is quite high, wow. and it's, it's voluntary, of course. We don't, we don't yeah. order people to vote, but it is high. 
I thought personally that uh, peace and security, foreign policy and NATO would become one of the key issues in the Swedish elections. It did not. Mm. So we had elections on Friday, uh, or sorry, on Sunday, and the result is still not there. But just to comfort uh, you and comfort, comfort ourselves, Sweden, as every country, always has a government. So now we have the former government sitting there. They are in control. They're waiting for the result that we probably will see tonight. But something has really happened. We have, if you look back in history, the Social Democrats dominated from, from the 20s, 30s uh, till the 70s. And then we started to see shifting uh, majorities at times. And now we have had the Social Democratic minority uh, leadership. And for the first time, we had also have a female, uh, female prime minister that we're very proud about. Uh, but as is often the case in democracies, at least in European democracies, if the same government has been in power for two periods, eight years, people start to get tired of their leaders, so they want to see something else. But uh, you can see that the Social Democrats, they really fared well. So they, uh, they got around 30% of the votes. But it seems like, and we are counting, it seems like we will have a change of government. We will see that. The way it looks like right now, the opposition, the more conservative, uh, liberal side will form a government. It's been a very infected debate, and I want to be honest about this. I thought it would be uh, foreign policy, I thought it would be health care, I thought it would be schools. It turned out to be something totally different that dominated the debate. Number one was energy, and it was not from a climate <laughs> perspective, but I think this you can see in many countries. The Russian invasion in Ukraine and the extremely strong uh, sanctions that has been imposed and the the morale amongst countries to also stand up for these countries. I want to take this opportunity to hail the Japanese government, but maybe even more so the Japanese public that stands up for, for this, that it is the right thing to do. Uh, but regardless, so the energy prices were, has been rushing, and people are worried. Uh, if you paid maybe uh, 50,000 yen to, to heat your house, uh, a month, uh, one year, uh, now maybe it will be 500,000 or maybe close to a million for some people. So it will be an enormous monthly cost increase. Inflation is being pushed. This is the same all over the world, but Swedes are worried. And then we created a nuclear power debate. So it was a bit unexpected. Sweden has been very lucky in our history. We have a fantastic supply of electricity through hydro, 50%, and nuclear, 30%. And then we basically set, and we don't import much from other countries. But we have, not least because of the accident in Fukushima, decided that we want to downscale nuclear. But now we have the same discussion as here in Japan. Maybe it's too early. The second one big discussion that we had was crime. Crime and law and order. And this is an embarrassing fact of Sweden. Thank you for all your beautiful words in the beginning. There are some, we are not paradise. I think a thing I like with Sweden is that we talk about the problems. We put problematic issues on the table. We have an extremely problematic situation right now. The gun shootings in Sweden are the by far highest in Europe. <laughs> and you really wonder why is this? And the number of deaths by gun shooting uh, in, in Sweden is already this year 45 mm. of 10 million people. And due to the very sad developments in Japan when former Prime Minister Abe was assassinated, I read articles about how much gun violence there is in Japan and it's basically zero. Last year was 10, 10 attacks with the gun and two were wounded and one was killed. And in Sweden we have you know, close to 500 gun attacks a year now and with close to 50 people killed already. So the question is, why is this? Why can't we deal with it? And this is a political issue, and uh, I think the opposition and the present government has been debating. I see that the opposition is, my personal view, unfortunately, making this an issue about immigrants. Mm. I, I think, personally, as we don't have a government yet, I have to be clear that this is my personal view. <laughs> I think personally, I think it's more about integration because we have received the people we have. The Swedes are 10 million people and 20% have other origins, but we can't throw people out. If they're there, they're there. We need to integrate. We need to find a way forward. So finally, on the elections, as I said, uh, we always have a government. It looks like if we have a result tonight, 
uh, this will move quite swiftly and quickly. Uh, and then uh, Parliament will open around the 26th or 27th of September. If the present government stays, she will just, our now Prime Minister, just declare our new proposal for the government and present her ministers. But as, I, as, as it looks like, the new Prime Minister will be chosen. And then he or she, it will most likely be a he, uh, need to negotiate a coalition because no one has a majority. Social Democrats, 30%. The new Sweden Democrats, that is the big change in Swedish politics, that has more of an uh, uh, anti-immigration agenda, has grown from nothing 15 years ago mm -hmm. to 20% today. You see this trend in many European countries. It's very evident in Sweden. They got about 20%, the former Conservative Party, 19 So regardless, it needs to be long dialogue and, and discussion. We hope it will go fast. Uh, last time it took almost 100 days, so three months. There are some fantastic examples in Belgium. and I think Belgium took almost one and a half year before they could form a government. This is not good, even though we have a government always, of course, a caretaker government. But you want to see a quick change on this. Very final. Do I have two more minutes? You have all the time. Uh -huh. but, uh, I think we should also have more of a Q&A session. <laughs> but uh, Sweden in the world. And, and Japan in this. Well, we, sometimes uh, my leaders uh, call themselves, and the government that is now uh, coming to the end of this mandate period, has, has, they call themselves a humanitarian superpower, typically Swedish. We have a problem with our self-image sometimes. Uh, if, and I have the same type of problem, I think. Very often, Swedes want to go around and, uh, in the world and uh, tell people how they should do. You know, you should, if you do it like this, and if you just reform like this, and if you behave like this, then you will be a fantastic place. That's, this is a very bad habit of Swedes. So when you meet Swedes and Nordics that have this missionary ambition, uh, it's like calm, the Viking, right? The calm, them down, <laughs> calm them down a little bit. But it's not that we are a bragging type, I don't think so at least, but I think we are very often passionately mm. convinced that we, we are doing things in a good way. But, so. My leaders then that call ourselves a humanitarian superpower. We want to remember that we cannot only be isolated in Europe or in the Nordic countries or in Sweden. Everything is linked together. Climate change, that was surprisingly absent from the Swedish election campaign yeah. this time, as was the NATO application, as it was already sent in. So these two issues, climate and peace and security, surprisingly absent. But of course, it is there. We, can't, we, we all see it with our own eyes. We feel it in, with the heat, and we see the ice melting. So, and here is only international cooperation that works. Sweden is pushing this hard, both with innovation, but also with agreements. So, I think international cooperation regarding global challenges of mutual concern. These are things Sweden is always committed to. And here we want to work with Japan. As I said, we are small, 10 million. If we are the Nordics, we are a bit bigger, 27. But most of all, we are in the European Union. Sweden will take over the presidency of the European Union 1st of January next year, same time as Japan will take over the presidency or the chairmanship of the G7. Hmm. So we have plans, as, as soon as I have a prime minister in place, we have plans to work together with the Japanese to do something jointly during this period. Uh, because there are so many similarities between Sweden and Japan, I see. I think we, are, we focus on science, research, and development. We focus on innovation. Uh, one of the huge assets Sweden has in this country is a Nobel Prize, of course, because Japan hails its academic and, and, and science uh, advances and, and ideas. So here we can do so much together when it comes to long-term sustainability and innovation in these things. We have an EU-Japan agreement. It's a trade agreement, but it's wider than that. It's also a partnership. And not least the Russian aggression has shown that we in the world, uh, democracies, liberal democracies in the world, need to work together to stand up for a rules-based world order. I mean, that's why Sweden reacted together with Finland so strongly. We didn't, we didn't want to change our security approach, but Russia forced us to. We are right there in the Baltic, neighbors with Russia. We need not only to be a part of the protection by NATO, we also feel that we can contribute. Mm. 
And therefore, I think this unified voice of Western democracies standing up for a rules-based world order, and you can't change borders like just because you want to, with historic references. Uh, so here, I think Japan and the EU can do much together. Peace and security, climate change. When I try, me, me and my colleagues, and I'm very happy to be joined by my deputy head of mission, Lena von Sydow, today, uh, when, when, we, uh, when we try to argue to our political leaders back home in our capital, Stockholm, we say we need to focus to create closer personal links with the leadership in Japan. Here, here I need your advice. I think it's working fine, but it could be even better. I would like to see my prime minister, my foreign minister, my trade minister be on an SMS basis with the Japanese counterparts, not only meeting in formal meetings with 15 suit-dressed men, mostly men, some women, uh, and then meeting, shaking hands, and say, good, see you next time. This is real life things, and an ambassador and an embassy can only do so much. I think this, so this would be an ambition for us. So Sweden in the world is really cooperating with Japan in the world, and uh, it all boils down to individuals, doesn't it? So I think one should not forget the strong, and this will be my final comment, my strong, the strong contacts between our two countries. Sweden and Japan have had diplomatic relations for 150 years. We had some Swedish researchers here even before that. Linnaeus, who gave name to plants and flowers all over the world, he had a disciple here in the end of the 1700s. Sneaked in as a Dutchman, but he sneaked in. Viking behavior, sneaking in. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have 150 years of this, and, and we have so much in common, and we are fascinated by each other. I think Swedes want to go to Japan. Mm. And every time I meet Japanese people and I tell them I'm from Sweden or I'm from Hokkuo, then they know so many things about places they want to go, things they want to see. I'll be happy to answer any questions about absolutely anything, but this was on my mind right now. I hope you found it somewhat interesting. Thank you. No, much. Your Excellency. Uh, fantastic. I think this was a wonderful uh, sort of overview and, uh, you know, putting Sweden... Um, you know, on the map, so to speak, and also not being shy about some of the problems. I think many, I certainly didn't know uh, that you were rivaling America um, <laughs> with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the gun violence there. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, sort of a very, very serious uh, topic, um, which is, um, you know, uh, immigration and uh, the uh, challenge to move on from immigration to integration. And really, in your personal view, um, you know, whether there are any lessons, right, for Japan. I mean, Japan obviously has stayed relatively, compared to anybody, really a very, very closed system. But, um, you know, I think in, for example, thinking about the preparations for uh, a possible event in Taiwan, um, you know, there will be more immigrants, more asylum seekers, um, you know, in Japan. Um, from your personal perspective, sort of any pieces of advice of what the Swedish model of immigration and integration did right and where, in your personal view, um, you know, Japan should be very mindful um, and, uh, you know, perhaps seek for some uh, improvement. Thanks. It's a great question. And this is actually the center of the debate, both politically but also around many, many, many dinner tables uh, in, in, in the country. First, when it comes to Japan, I would think, Japan needs to think about, first of all, the aging population. Mm. So you have to, I think one should separate migration yeah. and, and asylum seekers or refugees. So if it's only migration, Sweden started early with this because we needed the labor. Yeah. I mean, we were not enough people for our heavy and well-respected well industry. So I very often say to Japanese when I speak to, to Japanese decision makers, as you have a problem with an aging society, there are three things you need to do, preferably all three of them. Make more babies, but apparently you're not doing that. Uh, get more women into the workforce. I mean, it's, it's a waste of resources and money and, and, and development capacity if women stay home and they are not working. That's a Swedish view, in my view. Or open up for immigration because that will help. 
Then when it comes to asylum seekers and refugees, my personal view, it's the right thing to do. I mean, you can't question that. Germany and Sweden, during the big migration crisis in 2015, really stood up. Mm. It was Chancellor Merkel and the Swedish then Prime Minister Fredrik Reinfeldt who said, open your hearts or we shaffiness, we can mm. make it. In hindsight, of course, you, we can't have 7 billion people in Sweden. That goes without saying. You can't have 7 billion people in Germany either. So we have been naive. We thought, and some people still think, I would argue we thought, that our welfare state would be able to cope with an enormous migration that in, the, in 2015 it was 165,000 people that came in one year. And remember, we are, we are 10 million. The city where I grew up is the 10th largest city in Sweden, Sundsvall in the north. We have 100,000 people. So the 10th largest city of my country is 100,000 people. We took twice that figure in one year. And we've been doing this now for, that was a record year. So, but it's many, many, many hundreds of thousands that have come, and we have not coped. Because you come, and especially if you have people coming from Somalia, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Iraq, Syria, maybe with a totally crashed education system, and you put people together, not in camps. I mean, we offered, as soon as you enter Sweden as a refugee, you get the same type of treatment after you have been, all, all your status have been checked, so you're given an apartment, you can freely choose, or you, at least you can indicate where you want to stay, and you get child support, you get social support, you get unemployment support. So Swedish people that have been living in generations in my country felt, I've been working very hard and my pension is low, and then I see all these other people are coming in, and what do I get? You know. So I say this because this, Japan needs to do two things at the same time, I think. First, think it's the right thing to do, because this Japan is now showing with Ukraine, and you mentioned Taiwan, but we all know that we need to respect these international rules everywhere all the time. But the next step is also to be a humanitarian superpower. I think Japan has more potential to be a humanitarian superpower than Sweden, at least in numbers and figures. Maybe you don't want to go that way, but because it's the right thing to do. But then try to, in, it's about language, it's about schooling, uh, and here I think Sweden did not do enough to try to be a bit more social engineering, to make sure that people who come needs to have a, I don't know what you need, a mentor, uh, a coach, a guide, is like, took it for granted that everyone who came to our country would understand the Swedish complicated social welfare system as easily as any other Swede. I, some, a friend of mine gave me an example just to figure out I'm a father of two and I've been on paternity leave and I've been on, we got support from the government. But just to figure out online or in the booklet, what do I need to do? How do I fill out the papers? Uh, uh, how do I apply? What's the rules? I mean, it's tricky for me. And how do you do that? And if you don't speak Swedish and if you haven't gone to school, the more coaching. Beautiful story. My mother, uh, she's beautiful, of course, but uh, I think many, many mothers and older people in Sweden do this voluntarily. And I think we forget this sometimes in the Swedish debate. She, uh, she goes once a week in the city where she lives and she goes to a language cafe or a coffee, language coffee. So it's her and 10 other ladies. And they meet the, the, the newcomers in the little city where she lives. And there they try to speak, they laugh, they have coffee, they help each other out how to integrate. And I think social systems cannot fix this. Structure cannot fix this. It's about individuals. Sorry, I'm long on this, but I, for me, I don't understand. Sorry, I've been in Japan for three years now. Why are the Japanese not more curious about foreigners? You know, because I find it so exciting you know, to meet someone from Argentina or Japan or Fiji or Germany. You know, I want to know who, who are you? What do you think? What do you believe? And why do you believe in that? And what do you think will happen after we die? And what's the purpose of life? And if you really dream, what do you want to do? And then when I talk to Japanese that I don't know so well about this, I guess, why are you asking all these questions? <laughs> so, and I still haven't figured out in my three years. Uh, I, I, I think it's in, we are all human beings, right? They must be in there somewhere. So I would recommend the Japanese. Sorry, long answer. 
let out the curiosity of the rest of the world and feel that the rest of the world are inspired and loves Japan and we want to learn. People want to be here. So don't close your borders and get more students in. And send more Japanese people out in the world. Right. The curiosity <laughs> can cue mind, right? Uh, so, you know, that's, I think, uh, you know, something that uh, maybe we can take up uh, with uh, some personal anecdotes in the, in the Q&A or for drinks maybe, uh, you know, at some, uh, uh, some evening here. A um, very quick uh, pivot um, before we open it up to the, uh, to the, to the audience here. Um, energy. Energy and the environment. I mean, arguably the most famous Swede uh, is, uh, how old is she now? 17 years old, right? Greta Thunberg. Yes. Right? Um, so I, I'm going to tell a funny story. I was in Berlin when Greta Thunberg was at her peak, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, there was, in, in Germany, we still have these paper advertisements, Lipfasäulen, right? And there was an, an ad for the German equivalent of Tinder. A dating app, right? And it was the picture of uh, some beautiful young uh, blonde uh, uh, girl. And uh, the punchline at the top said, if the future of the world depends on a 16-year-old Swedish girl, you better get a partner. <laughs> anyway, so talk to me a little bit, um, you know, because I think arguably, you know, the fact that uh, Greta, um, you know, was actually able to energize around the world um, the young generation, yes. right? Uh, the young generation actually doing something that even our generation in the 1960s didn't do, uh, right? We didn't go on strike in high school. Right? We went on strike in university because we had a good time anyways. And, you know, but this obviously you know, sort of energized the youth uh, across the world. Talk to me a little bit about you know, how, number one, she's viewed in Sweden perhaps, mm -hmm. and then your personal view on the environment and uh, energy policy. It's, it's very interesting to think about her. I mean, because she says very clearly uh, she had no plans that this would happen. You know, it just... It just happened. She started, her, she and a few friends, she started alone in the beginning to strike on Fridays, as you yeah. say. Strike means then leaving school. In, in Sweden, it's mandatory to go to school. You have to go to school until ninth grade. You, if you don't, you are skipping it. It's against the rules, the laws, actually. So she striked, she sat outside parliament and this group. Why did it happen? I think because she didn't do it alone. Swedish youth has been taught uh, mm. since the 60s to question their teachers question their parents, you know, to n not to just disobey, but to always ask why? Mm. Why do we do this? Mm. And why is your, if you're saying one plus one is uh, two, why? Uh, if your father says you have to do this because blah, 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 then the kids will say why? So the, t the this but is... that's around the world. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm glad. It's around the world. So it came then from an environment of yep. reacting. So I think young people in Sweden and some older ones felt, as Greta Thunberg uh, famously quoted uh, in, in the UN General Assembly, is a lot of blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. The young people, uh, and she was a prime example of this, felt that political leaders talk about climate change, but nothing happens. Yeah. I would disagree. It's happening a lot. But I think it's important to have a young voice that says it's not happening enough. Mm and it's going too slow, uh, because science is there, and uh, so please listen to us. And I think as politicians made an error, that was a good error <laughs> from, from this movement's perspective, was that they started to embrace. Mm. So the political leaders came out, uh, political leaders in parliament came out, and they spoke to Greta, and they tried to give her a hug, and she was quite, you know, <laughs> She said, why do you come and hug me? You don't do anything anyway. So get, go back and decide something important. So she has kind of, she, has not, she did not want to become, become famous. Mm. Uh, so I think she has helped the world to wake up. She has helped Sweden to wake up. Uh, maybe uh, it, it has been good. Maybe it has, I, I'm, this is my very personal view. Now when the energy crisis hit and we have war, I didn't think we would have war in Europe, but now we have that. It seems like the priorities have somewhat switched, but she and also all political parties in the Swedish parliament and in Europe 
reminds us that climate change will not go away. Mm. It's there, we need to deal with it. Uh, so I think it comes from a critical thinking approach and it comes from a, 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 a tradition in Sweden to listen to kids. And uh, what will be interesting to see now, you refer to the 60s, and how, how you demonstrated in the 60s. I was still so young. So. My, my sister. My sister. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how will this turn into to organized work, because even if you might agree 100% with Greta, and you might be very, very, very upset with political leaders and business that they're not doing enough, someone needs to sit down. And I think the Swedish view here is international cooperation needs to go first. Sometimes I get a bit tired with countries, companies that say, let's collect plastic bottles, you know, then we, <laughs> then we do it or a tax uh, plastic bag. It's important, symbols are important, gestures are important, but the international framework is the key. And a personal view here is Japan is the mother and the father of the Kyoto Protocol. If I would be the Japanese prime minister, and Suga was onto this actually, even though his term was short, but he made some important decisions. If I would be the Japanese prime minister, I would really try to use that, you know, so the, the diplomatic uh, goodwill of Japan, if, if Japan would pick up on this. On energy, uh, we are lucky, as I said, I mean, we had 50% hydro and then nuclear, so we are basically self-sufficient, but the world is seeing an enormous energy crisis ahead, and we know this, and the problem is if we can't do, we need to re-transform our energy production into green at the same time as there, are huge, as, as there is a huge deficit of energy. So it's, it's a challenge, uh, but some, it, just to create hydrogen is not enough if hydrogen is produced by burning fossil fuels. Everyone knows this, but it is a challenge. Only thing that works is international yeah. and multilateral cooperation and some guts from the leaders there. Yeah. Let me ask you one final question. Um, you know, in prepara preparing for this, I read this, this absolutely fascinating. I mean, Sweden, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Sweden has a professional army, right? Yeah. You don't have a since draft. A few, since 10 years. Yeah, and uh, you have, uh, from this article, you have, uh, on average, it's about 5,000, uh, you know, men and women uh, who sign up on an average year um, to become professional soldiers or to join the army. Uh, since February 24th, according to this article, this has shot up to about 35,000 people mm -hmm. uh, having signed up uh, voluntarily uh, to become professional soldiers. Um, I mean, I'm a fellow European as a German, and I was, it's like a sucker punch into your stomach. Uh, we didn't think that war was going to be possible, mm -hmm. right, on the European continent, but, you know, we've unfortunately had to learn the hard way um, that it's the other way around. Talk to me a little bit about the change. Um, Sweden has always prided itself in its independence, taking care of its own business in terms of defense and having its own uh, you know, defense capability. Um, talk to us a little bit about the switch in the mood that has occurred. My view is, and, and this is a particular interest of mine, uh, that many people don't know perhaps, my view is that Sweden has a bad conscience when it comes to security in Europe. If you compare Sweden to the other Nordic countries, we did not stand up in, during the Second World War. Uh, we claimed our neutrality mm -hmm. and, and we benefited enormously because after the war our industry was ready to run. Uh, and we were basically supplying uh, Europe rebuilding with, with iron, with forests, with wood. Uh, the, Finland had a terrible war. Norway was occupied, Denmark was occupied. Uh, uh, I read, we have all read so many books about this. And what shall a government do? Well, you, you should protect your own people to be safe and stay out of war and so on, of course, many things. But I think, I say this because even me, I was born in 67, I have felt that, you know, it, we did not do the right thing there, perhaps. Mm -hmm. for, uh, so many people have felt that, and I think this explains a little bit this humanitarian mm -hmm. superpower approach. 
we have felt that we need to, if not pay back, at least show our solidarity strongly and immensely around the world. So Sweden has a, we are in the lead of putting percentage of GDP for foreign aid, for example. So 1% of our GDP every year, regardless of how much or how little we grow, goes to foreign aid. Uh, and, and that's a good thing, and it's important. But I also think that it has, and we all believed that we wouldn't see a war again. Mm. Even the then government, some 15 years ago, started to take, talk about the Swedish defense force as a sad interest. How do you call that in English? Uh, mm. uh, part, uh, special interest. Special. Uh, how can the government, uh, now criti criticizing my former leaders, how can, how can you call the core of any country's state function is defense and police and security, right? It's a special so, interest. It's a special interest suddenly, because there were so many retired generals that were pushing. So, so that's when we got rid of cons conscription. conscription. Um, but I think now everything has changed. Mm. Uh, and now uh, we, I think there will be a discussion about maybe restarting yeah. conscription again. I think the Swedish army is very ambitious now in its way to try to encourage young people to join. Uh, and I think no, no one would come up with the idea to call uh, the, the armed forces uh, specific interest. We are joining NATO. Yeah. We need to increase our defense budget, regardless if we join or not. We're also aiming for 2%. What many of you might know, and that is also an interesting fact that we Swedes need to deal with uh, when it comes to our morale, is that we are one of the key uh, exporters of uh, arms in the world. And many people wonder, how can you be that? But I think it, it, the expl explanation of its, historic, of its history is easy. Uh, when you are neutral, and you are non-aligned, you need to do everything yourself. Mm. So I, a little story is, I remember I was based in South Africa as a second secretary, uh, and I was meeting South African then, why? Uh, this was after apartheid collapsed, but you know, if you met South African military that were white, you didn't get emotions immediately. You know, these are bad guys, you thought, perhaps. But then I saw that these two countries, they met each other. Why? Because during the apartheid years, South Africa was isolated. They needed to create their own armed forces. And Sweden chose to be isolated, so we had to create our own. And we had a great invention and a great industrial sector. No. So yes, we are producing and we are exporting uh, also to Japan. Uh, uh, submarines, air, uh, cannons, and tanks, and all sorts of stuff. And the Swedish parliament have a very, very, very strict regulation that we only export to democracies. But this is a huge debate in Sweden as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Fantastic. I'd like to open it up to the floors. My name is Takehiro. Thank you so much. We are expecting to have more than 150 scholars and professionals for Mirai 2.0 event in November. Hi. Um, my question is about higher education. What kind of academic field do you expect more scientific research collaboration between Sweden and Japan? Thank oh, you. I'm, I'm happy to get that question. One of the beauties, one of the most beautiful things, I think, in the Swedish-Japanese relationship is called Mirai. Uh, it's not very public, perhaps, uh, but that's, it's a cooperation of how many universities now? 15, 18? 19, 19 universities in, in Sweden and in Japan on an academic field who meet and they get together. Uh, especially researchers working together on the university level, but also trying to attract at, uh, high, high university students to, to, to go in between. I would like to see, and therefore I'm also very happy to see Keio University here today, I would like to see not the descaling of the scientific field, on the contrary, we need to keep that, but I, in, in the past years, I think the focus has been on, on physics, chemistry, biology, science, and I think also it's a, it's, it's a Nobel Prize that is there and people want to cooperate on this. I think we also need to get into more societal uh, changes and, and uh, humani uh, humanitarian studies because I, I would love to see a Japanese Nobel Prize winner in economics one day. Uh, I perhaps don't see that happening in the Japanese economy, why someone should get it, but maybe there's a scholar somewhere that is thinking about something. So uh, that's what I would like to see. And uh, so I think it, it, this also has to do with the globalization and the internationalization and that we are all human beings and we're curious, right? 
So I want to see more university cooperation on all levels. So if you ever need the support of the Swedish ambassador, just my mobile number is on my card. <laughs> no one, I think I've handed out 10,000 cards in Japan since I arrived. And my mobile number is, in, is on every one of them. I think I've received three unexpected phone calls. <laughs> three, in three years. <laughs> Either I'm totally uninteresting or people are too polite. <laughs> people are too polite. I think, you know, that's, uh, don't take it personal. I think that's a systemic issue. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Um, any other questions from the floor? Please. My name is Shigesuke Kashui. I'm a senior advisor for EQT. Uh, the, I have one question. Swedish company. Swedish company, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the comprehensive you know, the remark, and the, which educated us a lot. But the, you mentioned that the, uh, the Sweden liberalized a lot of things, including the inheritance tax. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what was your change, the, what was the intended consequence, and what was the impact on the, your society and economy, given the fact that the Japan has a, one of the highest punitive in, in, inheritance tax around the world, you know, 50 yes. percent marginal tax rate, even to the asset inherited by the, your spouse. And that will be taxed again to the second generation. So that's the reason a lot of the wealthy Japanese people are starting moving, like Singapore, and community commuting to Japan. So, what very you... very interesting question. And this is actually much more than economy, because uh, I said a little. I, I tried to be a bit funny in the beginning and saying the image of Sweden is that we are half socialists and. There were some very interesting social democratic experiments going on in Sweden in the 70s and the 80s about making things more state controlled. But then came a reaction to that. First, our income tax and our wealth tax created extreme uh, absurdities. So some of the key company leaders and also some very famous art makers, you know, authors and filmmakers and the owners of IKEA and others said, we are leaving. We cannot stay here. So the government needed to think. I mean, we, we know where the big, in, the big income in any country doesn't come from me working 30 days per month and paying a certain percentage of my tax or my income for tax. It comes from, from corporations. So there were agreements already with the Social Democrats early. Uh, to find ways of not scaring companies or wealthy individuals out of the country. Then this was taken even further when we had the strong reaction. Uh, when, when did the alliance get elected? 2010, right? Six. Allianz Vieren, the first time. Six. So we had the conservative. Uh, or Talk more back of a, to your <laughs> We have, it's great to have, you know, the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a non google <laughs> exactly. So we had the government for, for eight years that really said, we need to make sure that we uh, make society more innovative, create new companies. And it has worked, I think. We have the, the most fascinating startup scene after California with, you know, mm. unicorns and startups, especially in Stockholm. Why? Because... It's good for business, but it's also a pleasant city to live in. But so this idea to liberalize and take away punitive taxes came as an idea of, I make it too easy if I say trickle down, but say if people get to keep more, they will invest more and they will create more jobs. You know, so that was the thinking. So then what do we need to get rid of? Well, then we have gift tax. That's a very unnecessary thing. If my mother wants to give me, or blah, blah, blah. And then... Uh, Inheritance tax so is zero. So uh, when my parents pass away, there will be no tax on the assets they transfer to me. And we have gone far. We have gone. This is also Sweden. I think we have gone very. We have, got, we have been a bit extreme. So we have moved very quickly. <laughs> and this is good news for the political opposition, the, the left party, the former communist party, and the socialist party, or social democratic party. They are a bit critical of this. Uh, but the thinking was exactly that. And then it's been created. Swedes are also uh, owners of capital on a very small level. So it's, the, the government has invented a very, in, in unison, a very smart savings form or for, a way of saving in shares and in funds that you can keep in a special account. I don't want to be too technical. That has. First, it makes it easy in your taxes that if you buy and sell, it's, it's, it's some sort of a one-off uh, just fee. 
and then uh, it's it's very it's very uh, positively for the owners taxed. So this is trying to make every Swede, every 10 million Swedes, some sort of an in, investor in funds and shares. And it's not a huge amount, but I think many, many people, many million of people now have this, it's called the ISK funds, it's a bit technical. But, so it's also an encouragement of people to save. Uh, but income tax is still high, and this is a problem we have. But inheritance tax, gift tax, and also property tax has gone down to a very low level. Mm. So we are quite a very liberal economy, not least to attract foreign companies and fine firms like EQT to, to be there. There's, uh, many Germans are emigrating to Sweden. Um, for exactly that reason. Um, so this. You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not because of the weather. Uh, <laughs> um, any additional questions? Uh, Johnny. Uh, uh, contrary to, it was very good that you pointed out the, the policy about uh, arms exports, because normally if a country is uh, a major arms exporter, it's a negative impact or a negative uh, profile. But in the case of Sweden, it makes you more a defender of democracy. And beyond that, over throughout the last hundred years, Sweden seems to be the magician in, in creating uh, peace pacts and uh, negotiating uh, trouble areas with other countries. Um, you're like the, the wise parent and the, some nations appear like the fighting kids and you calm them down and, and magically somehow negotiate quietly a, a peace pact. And again, you did it with uh, <clears throat> Turkey's opposition to uh, Sweden joining NATO. And could you give us any details on the compromises that had to be made or how the, how the magic works in this case? Thank you. Uh, that's very flattering. Uh, I think we, we Swedish diplomats, we always think that Norway is so much better than us on this. <laughs> <laughs> but what do we do? I think it's a tradition that is very similar to the Japanese. It's a pity we are, it's a pity Swedes are not so good in the Japanese language and that the Japanese are bad in, in Swedish. <laughs> because I think sometimes we think very similar. We, we, are, pa we are patient. We let things take time. We realize if people are upset, they, they need to talk themselves off a little bit. And it's important to create the venue or the meeting place. So, so I'll come back to quickly when we are also involved in the conflict. But what Sweden has often done is to create a meeting place. We, 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 in the North Korea crisis, well, no one has been able to solve that, but we are very proud that we have, we have had an open channel to Pyongyang the whole time. Mm. We, have, we have an embassy there, and they have a strong embassy in, in Stockholm, but we are never involved in the details, but perhaps you know that there have been several Stockholm meetings when the Americans and the North Koreans have come to Sweden to meet, we just facilitate. Mm. So that's one thing we do. Another thing we do is, I think, a pragmatic approach to, to diplomacy, realizing that you, know, you, need to, you need to lose some, you need to gain some. You can't go in all confrontational. So I think that has been a trick. On the Turkey issue, mm. well, we are not there yet. But I am convinced, uh, and we think, now, there are 30 members of NATO, and there are three remaining countries to, to, par to parliamentarily ratify our uh, application. And it's because uh, we think by 1st of October it will only be still Turkey. And Sweden, and, and I'm glad you note that Sweden and Turkey has a very positive history. So I'm, my personal view is uh, that we are progressing, we are talking, we are doing this together with Finland. And, the same way we look at any other negotiation in, in life and in the world, we need to listen to each other. We need to understand each other. This is also one of the reasons why I think I have one of the most fun jobs I could ever imagine, even though I would like to see being a bit better paid, but that's another story. <laughs> <You're> but <paying. laughs> but uh, that is to actually, instead of just coming with your own preconceived yeah. ideas, 
to try to open your ears a little longer than you open your mouth and uh, try it on how is this person that I'm meeting now thinking you know so it's so easy we know it's so easy to put your own world views into in, when I listen to you I, th I interpret you in my way but the warning bells needs to be ringing of course and uh, you need to try to see it from the other side and I think the Japanese and the Swedes could cooperate more here yeah. It's very interesting what you say about sort of a possible lesson for Japan, right? Sweden's ability to create the venue, right, to mediate. And perhaps, you know, the Kyoto Agreement, I mean, that was sort of one leading example, right? The venue was created, everybody came together, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, Japan is associated, right, with, um, you know, uh, having created a great agreement, right? Well, Ambassador, <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic. You. Um, you know, we could talk uh, forever, we could talk until you have a government, uh, which uh, hopefully is going to happen uh, you know, in a couple of hours. Um, I uh, want to thank you very, very much in the uh, name of uh, Asia Society and the I House here in Japan.